protection, help, and counsel. Every intellectual in emigration is, without exception, mutilated, and does well to acknowledge it to himself. If he wishes to avoid being cruelly apprised of it behind the tightly closed doors of his self-esteem, he lives in an environment that must remain incomprehensible to him, however flawless his knowledge of trade union organizations or the automobile industry may be. He is always astray. Between the reproduction of his own existence under the monopoly of mass culture and impartial responsible work yawns an irreconcilable breach. His language has been expropriated and the historical dimension that nourished his knowledge sapped. The isolation is made worse by the formation of closed and politically controlled groups, mistrustful of their members, hostile to those branded different. The share of the social product that falls to aliens is insufficient and forces them into a hopeless second struggle within the general competition. All this leaves no individual unmarked. Even the man spared the ignominy of direct coordination bears as a special mark this very exemption, an illusory, unreal existence in the life process of society. Relations between outcasts are even more poisoned than between long-standing residents. All emphases are wrong, perspectives disrupted. Private life asserts itself unduly, hectically, vampire-like, trying convulsively, because it really no longer exists to prove it is alive. Public life is reduced to an unspoken oath of allegiance to the platform. The eyes take on a manic yet cold look of grasping, devouring, commandeering. There is no remedy but steadfast diagnosis of oneself and others, the attempt through awareness, if not to escape doom, at least to rob it of its dreadful violence, that of blindness. At most caution is called for, particularly in the choice of private acquaintances, as far as choice still remains. Above all, one should beware of seeking out the mighty and expecting something of them. The eye for possible advantages is the mortal enemy of all human relationships. From these solidarity and loyalty can ensue, but never from thoughts of practical ends. Hardly less dangerous are the mirror images of the mighty lackeys, flatterers, and cadgers, who ingratiate themselves with those better off than they in archaistic manner that can flourish only in the economically extraterritorial circumstances of emigration. While they may bring their protector trivial advantages, they drag him down the moment he accepts them, as he is ceaselessly seduced to do by his own helplessness in a strange country. If in Europe the esoteric gesture was often only a pretext for the blindest self-interest, the concept of austerity, the hardly ship-shape or watertight, still seems in emigration the most acceptable lifeboat. Only a few admittedly have a seaworthy example at their disposal. To most boarders, it threatens starvation or madness.